Thank you so much. I'm absolutely chuffed to be here. Um, really, really exciting. Um, I actually got invited uh, last year, but I had twins. Uh, so I've had a kind of crazy year where, yep, <laughs> a four-year-old and 15-month-old twins uh, in my first year in the job. So it's been pretty punchy. Um, but I'm really looking forward to what I hope uh, will be just a really vibrant um, exchange of ideas. So I'll sort of throw out a provocation and then leave enough time for us to have a conversation. Um, to sort of ask questions, exchange ideas, and hopefully forge a way forward. Um, so I'm the chief exec of a think tank um, called the New Economics Foundation. We were set up about 30 years ago. And throughout our 30-year history, we have essentially been arguing that the economy is broken because it does not work for the majority of people and it does not work for our planet. And in the end... If you want to achieve economic, if you want to achieve environmental justice, you've got to overhaul the economic system and the free market uh, rules, to use the jargon, the neoliberal rules that underpin it. The thing that's been really, really interesting for us as an organization, and absolutely fascinating for me personally, is that what was a fringe argument, what was an outlier argument for much of our 30-year history is now entering the fore of the political debate and becoming mainstream. So if you cast your mind back to the 2017 general election, pretty much every major political party went into that election saying the economy doesn't work. And they were saying this because they were reflecting a deep sense in the country that the economy is rigged and the system is not on people's side. And that the social contract that has dominated the fabric of our politics since the mid-40s is fraying. That basic promise that if you work hard, if you do the right things, you'll get ahead, and more importantly, your kids will do better than you, that promise is breaking down. And I think people are understandably fed up. I think they're frustrated. I think they're angry. And I think they want change. And for me, you know, that's the lens in which I see the Brexit vote. Now, I, I, I wasn't going to mention the B word, but I can't resist. Um, so sorry. But, you know, whether you agree with the Brexit vote or not, what's clear is that in the end, that vote was a call for change. And yes, I think people voted for many reasons. And interesting, the research that we've seen on this says that there was this coalition which a third of people who were voting for their sovereignty, um, and it was a reaction and a rejection of the European Union, but for a third of people, it was an expression of discontent and frustration with the status quo and a political vote for change. And then there was a third, which it was an anti-immigration vote in response to genuine economic pressures that people are feeling. So, you know, if you take those two thirds, for a chunk of the people that voted to leave, and I would argue, you know, the numbers that were absolutely decisive in shifting it from a leave vote to a remain vote, that historic vote was a call for change. Yes, a slap in the face of the political elite, um, you know, but it was a clear message from communities that I think had been ignored for too long and had been served poorly by our current system that they wanted something more, something better than the current political settlement. And the climate for change is not going to go away. And in fact, I think it's just going to get louder and louder. And for me, the real travesty of the last three years is that what should have been a wake-up call, what should have been a pivotal moment for change, has been squandered. So we've had three years in which our political class have been consumed with the ins and outs of leaving the European Union, where they've been dogged by infighting, and the domestic agenda, the thing that will drive the change that people so desperately need, has been sidelined. Meanwhile, the disquiet that was there three years ago continues to grow, and the demand for something better than the current settlement becomes more entrenched. So in the end, whether we leave the European Union or not, we have to respond to this call for change. And I believe that this will be the defining political issue for the next decade. And our view at NEF is that actually this is not the time for tinkering around the margins. It is not the time for incremental change. 
this is the time for quite fundamental, and I use the word boldly, radical change to the way that our economy is run. And we would argue that actually the conditions for this sort of change, the kind of change that we've been talking about for 30 years, is taking root. And there are three things that are driving a crisis in our current economic system. And we think that they're going to come together in quite a profound, quite a terrifying way over the next five to 10 years to create a perfect storm. But in that storm creates the hope, the chance, the opportunity for change. So the first is economic breakdown, which we're seeing in the most visceral way across the country. It feels like the fallout from the global financial crisis is catching up with us. So a crisis that revealed the shortcomings of the economic system, but actually the pain that we've had in the 10 years after the crisis has shown its fundamental contradictions in stark terms. So it's resulted in a decade in which wages have flatlined. It's the longest period of earning stagnation we've had for about 150 years. And we've got ourselves into this really strange situation where we're told the economy's growing. The facts, the stats tell us the economy's growing, but people are not benefiting from it. Instead, they're being squeezed as the cost of essential things they rely on, housing, energy, transport grows. We're seeing that many people are having to borrow just to get by, so household debt is at record levels. And we've got 14 million people that are living in poverty in this country. One in three of our children are living in poverty in this country. And at the very time when people needed help the most, our public services, our welfare state has been decimated in the name of austerity. Meanwhile, inequality is on the rise. And for me, there are a handful of stats that I just reach out to that put this in stark terms. So today, the wealthiest 10% of households now own 45% of this country's wealth, while the bottom 50%, so huge chunks of our economy, our population, own just 9% of this wealth. 30 years ago, a typical company chief exec, not a chief exec of a charity like my own, but a typical company chief exec was paid about 20 times the salary of the average worker. Today, it is nearly 120 times, 120 times the salary of the average worker. And last year, 1,400 senior managers at the FTSE 100 companies, so this is 0.03% of the total workforce, were paid over 2 billion in total. That's an average about 1.6 million each. And this is at the same time that people are being paid poverty wages. So, you know, my take on this is that this sort of inequality is quite frankly endemic in the current economic system. But I think people were willing to suck it up. They were willing to swallow it up as long as they were doing incrementally better from the status quo. Now, and essentially, the logic of what economists will call triple, trickle down economics held. As soon as this breaks down, in the way that we've seen over the last 10 years. I think the public tolerance for this sort of inequality hits a buffer in a way that starts to call into question the very model and opens up public appetite and opens up public consent for radical change. So that's the economic breakdown. The second driver is the political crisis, which we are all too familiar with. So this widespread disaffection um, and this lack of trust in our politicians and our political institutions that is beginning to undermine, or more, more to the point, which is absolutely undermining our democracy, but that's now spreading beyond politics to a lack of trust in the media, to be fair, in many instances justified, but as well as a sort of lack of trust in businesses, in charities even. And this sense that there is a detached elite uh, that is either unable or unwilling to solve the problems that people face. And the political implosion that we've seen over Brexit, I think has simply reinforced this. This is now giving space to the rise of white right-wing populism with its politics of divide, its easy solutions that don't really offer proper answers, and which is a threat to those of us who believe in progressive radical change. And then you overlay this with the third driver, 
which in my view is the most profound, and that is the environmental tipping point that we're at. In the end, the threat to our planet and the impact of environmental degradation is the biggest threat to economic and social justice we will face. And what we're being told by the ecologists is that we are now at a tipping point in the depletion of our natural resources, which will start to bite on people's day-to-day -day lives in a very real way. And it's not just the climate emergency where the experts have told us we literally have 12 years to take urgent action to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, but it's also the wider damage to our environment. It's the fact that we are depleting the Earth's, Earth's natural resources at one and a half times its ability to regenerate. By 2025, we're told two thirds of the world's population could be living under water stress conditions. And at the rate at which we are degrading topsoil, we may only have 60 harvests less. 80% of the world's fisheries are either fully or overexploited. Now this is scary stuff, which is often put in the too scary to think about or the too difficult to think about box. But we're going to have to start shaking ourselves as a society out of our environmental complacency, whether we are ready to or not. And we're already starting to see the shift in public opinion as climate change now moves up the political agenda and people see it as the number one issue. And so now our politics must respond. So these three things, the economic, the political, the environmental, will come together in the next 10 years. And we believe create the conditions to ch for change. The key question is whether this change will be progressive change or regressive change. And our view is that if it is to be the former, then actually we need progressives to come together as a movement to articulate an alternative and to drive and create momentum for that alternative and be clear about what the route map is to get there. And this is at the heart of the work that we are doing at the New Economics Foundation. So we're absolutely clear, this four Decade-old model, this neoliberal model, is absolutely exhausted. We need new economics that works for people and that works for the planet. And for us, there are six things that sit at the heart of this new economy, the building blocks of an alternative economic system. So, first and foremost, it's got to be an economy that is rooted in a thriving, envir and, thriving and vibrant in environment in which an urgent green transition is seen as the priority, and which we accept that we have to operate within environmental limits. Second, it's got to be an economy that delivers improvements in well-being and more equal living standards. One in which the basics for a decent quality of life, a minimum income below which no one can fall, Housing, healthcare, social care, childcare, education are universal, they're guaranteed for all, and they are provided collectively. Third, it's got to be an economy that is built by progressive businesses who work in the long term, who work in the public interest, where they regain that sense of social purpose that used to be the hallmarks of the best corporations, with stronger voice and power for workers, social and environmental responsibility baked into the business model, social and community interest taking precedence over shareholder interest. Fourth, and critically, it's got to be an economy that gives people ownership and a stake through common ownership of public goods, so our land, our green spaces, our community assets, but also common ownership of essential infrastructure that people rely on day to day. So how we move around our transport, our water, our energy. And you know, this doesn't mean clunky national bureaucracies running everything from the top. It can be achieved through municipal ownership, through community ownership too. But it also means thinking about cooperative, mutual, employee ownership of businesses, of technology, of our assets. Fifth, 
Our view is this economy needs to be supported and stewarded by an active government that is willing to work and intervene to drive social and environmental outcomes, but where significant power is pushed down to strong decentralized local states that are rooted in communities and shaped and informed by strong democratic participation. And then finally, and possibly most importantly, it has to be an economy where people have more power over the things that affect their day-to-day -day lives, in which they can act collectively to shape their lot. Now, if these are the building blocks of a different type of economic system, if these are the building blocks of a new economy, then the question is, how do we get there? Is this just utopian pie-in-the-sky thinking, or can it be achieved? Now, our view is that to get there, it requires us to develop radical policies to drive big change and to respond to the big challenges that we face. And to do this, it means thinking about the immediate crises we face, climate emergency, housing, the squeezing on living standards, and thinking about ways in which we can respond and find an answer to these problems, yes, but do it in a way that is catalytic to driving the long-term change that we want to see and creating the stepping stones for a new economy. And I hear, I think the Brexit shambles uh, creates a really interesting uh, window. Because yes, Brexit has brought about uncertainty, it's brought about impasse, it's brought about anger, it's brought about division, but it also creates an opportunity for national renewal. So I have no idea what's going to happen in the next uh, two months. Uh, I've been in politics for a while and I've never been in the space where you literally can't predict where this is going to end up. So I don't know if we will crash out on October 31st, as our new prime minister keeps telling us. I don't know if we will cobble up some sort of a deal um, in which we're able to leave on more uh, measured and planned terms. Or I don't know whether in the end, a second referendum becomes the way out of this mess. But what I do know is that the political debate must move beyond Brexit. And the anger and the rancor that will come about if it doesn't is unthinkable. And at that point, all sides across the political spectrum are going to have to offer a new deal to the country, something akin to a new social settlement that can calm the rancor, that can heal the divide, and can renew the country. And we think that this is a huge opportunity, but for us to seize on that opportunity, it requires a big social movement to start saying this is the change we want and to start demanding that change. And for us, we think there are three fundamental pillars that sit or could sit at the heart of this social settlement. So, the first is a Green New Deal. Now, this is an idea that was pushed out by NEF about 10 years ago in collaboration with other partners, was then revived and given a new currency in the US by the Sunrise Movement and AOC, and has come back with a vengeance in the UK as a growing movement led by the youth strikers are now calling for a Green New Deal. The idea is a simple one. It says, look, in order to deal with the climate emergency, we need an unprecedented mobilization of resources, the kind of mo mobilization of resources that we have never achieved in peacetime. And we need to do this in a way to decarbonize the economy at pace whilst creating jobs and lifting and people's living standards. Now, at the heart of this idea of the Green New Deal is a recognition that actually the climate change, the climate emergency, and the wider threat to our environment is a system of this very economic model that is broken. The same economic system that has left mi millions of people squeezed and given rise to poverty and inequality. So to tackle climate change, you've got to tra transform the economy. It isn't just an environmental agenda, it's an economic agenda. And so to do this, we think you've got to get th three things absolutely right. First, ambition. So we need to radically decarbonize our economy at pace and at a much, much faster rate than our net zero target by 2050 allows for. Second, it means significant government action 
from large-scale investment in green infrastructure, in green technology, in green industries, as well as incentives and regulation to bend markets that have been slow to respond to the climate imperative. So for a start, let's ban fossil fuel subsidies and plow it back into renewables. So we're talking about a big fiscal stimulus, and we think that we need to be moving to at least a minimum of 2% of GDP going into driving the green transition, ramping up to 5% of GDP, as well as active monetary policy. So getting the central bank to shift its mandate and see that driving the green transition is as important and is as big of a risk uh, to the economy as anything else but also taking far more active role in monetary policy. So we talk about credit guidance, where the central bank would essentially put caps and quotas on the amount of investment that the financial markets can put on dirty versus green investment to start shifting the way that the financial markets work. Third, I think in return for consenting to what will be quite a radical change, you know, change in every aspect of how we do things, the food we eat, how we travel, the homes in which we live in, there's got to be a good deal for the public. There's got to be a good deal for people in this. So a promise, yes, to create better jobs where jobs will be lost. And I think we've got to be honest that in parts of the country where we are shifting away from fossil industries, people will lose jobs. And actually, it's the responsibility to think about how we create cleaner, better, greener jobs. But also, it means giving people a stake on the green economy that will emerge. So you will notice a theme. Common ownership of green infrastructure and assets. So the state at both the national and the local level getting involved in shaping the way the green industry works but investing it and putting this back in trust that is owned by all of us. But also cooperative ways of organizing businesses, industries that will spring up in the green economy. So the Green New Deal for us is a first pillar. The second pillar is renewing the social contract to replace the one that has been frayed. First and foremost, that means a better deal for workers. So tackling this issue of wages and the growing power imbalance in the workplace between shareholders and workers. And firstly, thinking about actually, you know, the government has a huge effect on how businesses operate. And yet it doesn't use any of the leaders, levers that it has, corporation tax, regulations, incentive subsidies, in order to try and shift and drive business behavior. So our view is actually use those levers, reward companies that reward their workers fairly and penalize companies that don't. So the first piece, active government policy to try and drive a fairer deal for workers. But this has got to then be supported by strengthening the power of workers in workplaces so they can protect their own interest. So stronger collective bargaining, which has been eroded over the last 20, 30 years, but also mandating businesses to automatically recognize unions and giving workers the time to organize and be active. But for us, that doesn't go far enough. We also need to think about how we create greater ownership of the organizations in which p people work, which is why we've been calling for this idea of an employee ownership fund, which would essentially see a share of profits each year transferred over to worker workers in the form of equity in a worker or stakeholder fund. These shares would come with voting rights in order to give workers a say in the direction of businesses and how they're run. And each year, the share that workers own would grow until we reach a tipping point in which workers own a dominant share of the economy. But you know, it's not just giving returns to workers in the form of wages, it's also their time. And you know, at NEF, we've been long calling for a shorter working week. So our research has shown that actually for most of, most of the post-war period, the average full-time week for work steadily fell from 46 hours to 40 hours. And this was part of a longer term trend in which we moved from a seven day working week to a five day working week. So the amount of time that we spend in work is not mandated by some natural law. It is a function of the decisions that we make as a society and are willing to shift the balance between work and leisure. And our view is that actually, you know, this 
trend that we saw in the post-war period then stagnated from the 1980s onwards as uh, the kind of deregulation free market agenda set in, but also the power and the collective bargaining of unions was curtailed. And what we saw is stagnation for the last 30 years. And actually, if we'd continued at the post-war trend, then we would actually be on track, just organically, naturally, through increases in productivity, through regulation, through collective bargaining, we would be on track for a four-day week, so 30 hours a week uh, by 2040. So there is a trend that has been bucked that we've got to try and reverse. And so for us, this is in part done by national policy. So one of the things that we are calling for is a working time commission. We're actually um, an organization, a bit like the kind of low pay commission, looks at changes in the economy, looks at where there have been gains in the economy, and then says, well, we increase statutory, to, statutory holidays as a result. So action at the top, but that's got to be complemented by action on the ground. So industrial campaigns in which unions work, campaign, negotiate for a shorter working week in workplace after workplace after workplace. But that only takes us so far. In addition to a fairer deal for workers in the workplace, we think that it's absolutely critical that actually our state, our government, our society moves us to a place where protecting people's well-being, improving people's well-being becomes a fundamental goal. So we are talking about reconfiguring the welfare state model, which in some respects has reached the bounds of what it can do, and shifting to a well-being state model, one in which actually a minimum income is something that is provided collectively. So everyone, no matter whether you're in work or not in work, particularly in the context of the change that we're going to see with automation, with the green transition, everyone knows that there is a minimum income upon which they cannot fall, so you can provide food for your kids, so you can get from A to B. But in addition, complement that, complementing that with universal basic services, funded by progressive taxation, protect, provided communally and collectively, but this would include housing, but should be a basic right. No, it's not something that certain people who can afford it should be able to have a home, and those that don't, shouldn't. And actually, that us as a society, ensuring that everyone has access to housing is a basic thing that we should expect to do in an advanced society. So housing, social care, health, education, childcare, Childcare that is fundamental for the ability to women, for women to participate in the labor market, but fundamentally shapes the life chances of our children. Make that a universal requirement. And then the final pillar is the one to democratize our economy, pushing power and ownership down to people and their communities. So this means rapid and radical devolution of power to nations of this country, as well as to local and regional government. And in return, the deal should be that actually local leaders would look to improve the well-being and the livelihoods of their community by shifting away from this growth-centered model, this idea that if we invest in big infrastructure, if we just grow our economy, people will do better. It doesn't work. We've seen this over the last 10 years. It doesn't work. And moving to one in which it is a well-being-centered economy. And using the procurement, the investment, the commissioning power of the local state to boost local jobs, to support locally owned firms, and to fundamentally change the structure of local economies so that we create the new economy from place to place up until we change the nature of the country. So pump priming worker cooperatives, shifting and pump priming community ownership, and for me, there's a really interesting case study, which is the Mondragon Corporation in the Basque Country, which provides a really powerful insight into how this can be done. So this was set up in 1945, 56 rather, uh, to provide local employment through worker cooperatives. It survived for 60 years, so it survived through the wanes and the waxes of the economy and has now become one of the 10 largest business groups and the fourth largest employer in Spain. So 200 different companies and subsidiaries and over 75,000 workers. 
And I think there's also the space, not just for the local state to be active in shifting the nature of the economy, but for it to take an active role in providing the things I talk about, the basic infrastructure that we need. So municipal transport, municipal energy, municipal water, th through municipal corporations that are accountable to local people. So three pillars. Three ideas, three pillars of a potential new social contract. And there are many more ideas where this came from. But you know, for me, it's not just about new ideas. And organizations like us, we trade on coming up with things. We've done this for 30 years and we'll do it for 20 years more or 30 years more until hopefully we achieve the new economy and we become redundant. But you know, it's about how we create these ideas and how we do things in a different way. So for us, a new economics of people and planet must be led by those that are experiencing the ill effects of the old economy most acutely. So our starting point in all of this is that we've got to start with communities. We've got to work with people who are at the sharp end of fighting against a system that is broken. To develop solutions that work and put the new economics in practice. And there are examples, amazing examples of this up and down the country. So whether it's in Derbyshire villages where we've worked fighting uh, plans for fracking their countryside, or families in Deptford that have come together to create parent-led cooperative childcare, or, organizers or employees that are already organizing their businesses in a different way, community land trusts that are buying up land, providing affordable housing that they're holding in trust for their people locally. All examples of people shifting wealth and power in a way that is starting to chip away at the old system. And we believe that if you can tap into this energy, this insight, the innovation, the desire for change, and build a social movement that can demand this change, that can ask for something better than what we currently have, and create momentum for this change, I know we've seen this over the last six months, where the energy, the focus of Extinction Rebellion, the youth strikers has put climate change back at the top of the political agenda, so it can be done. But if we can mobilize this social movement to demand for a new social settlement, coming out of whatever we end up getting to with Brexit, then maybe, just maybe, we can begin to unleash the sort of change that I think so many of us in this room want to see, and perhaps, just perhaps, start creating the stepping stones towards a new economy. Thank you.